On this episode, my dear friend and business partner, Matt Higgins, stops by. Also, he's about to be a shark. Hey everybody, this is Gary Vay, Nerd Chuck, and this is episode 297 of the Ask Gary V Show, and I'm super excited because, has AJ been on this show? No. All right, so this is literally probably the person I'm most closest to that I've ever done a show with. Uh, my business partner o- over the last decade. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute, but Matt Higgins is here. Couple things that are exciting about this episode. Number one, he looks better than ever, which makes sense because he's on this in- incredible publicity spree because he is now a shark on one of the most famous shows in business, period. Are you wearing shark socks? I see it, Matt. Uh, <laughs> guest star uh, of Shark Tank this year. Uh, very much well deserved. I'm gonna let you tell. I'm gonna let him tell you his origin story because that's what we do with every guest here. But it interwines very much with my career as well, and I think a lot of you will enjoy it. And, and really, where I want to go because we're both here, I think knowing my audience, uh, I want to do as many calls as possible, which is something we haven't been doing as much. So I'm gonna let Matt kind of establish comic book number one, tell his you know kind of origin story. Uh, then I'll throw out a couple questions and then we'll get into the uh, the phone call. So Facebook, I know you're watching live right now, put in your phone call and your question, uh, especially as Matt starts telling his story, I think it will make sense. Matt, how are you? I'm doing great. Nice to see you, Thanks Looking for having great. me, Gary. It's awesome. Cool, take it away. All right. Who are um, you? Who am I? Uh, like yes. grew up the whole bit. I all tend right. to like those sh- okay. things. Okay, all right. I grew up in Bayside, Queens okay. on Springfield Boulevard. Born mm-hmm. at Flushing Hospital, mm-hmm. uh, hustled in Queens my whole early life. First job McDonald's, mm-hmm. actually first first job selling flowers on the street. Mm-hmm. Second job McDonald's. Uh, I uh, grew up real poor, taking care of my. You know this, but I'm yep. telling you to yep. you like you don't. I don't. To the world. I do not know. And um, yeah, Anything. I grew up uh, single mother who yes. was amazing and taking care of four miserable boys. Yes. And der- and what boy were you? I was the I was the youngest. Okay. And sometimes, you know, shit rolls downhill, so sure. so it you know, landed in my lap, but uh grew up really poor. I know everybody says that, but government cheese in the refrigerator and you know the whole bit, yep. church church pantries on Sunday. And um, my mother was amazing and always trying to get ahead in life, but everything for me was about how do I get out of this situation as quickly as humanly possible. Yes. And, uh, how quickly did you figure that out? You think like what now when you reconcile that, like it's been interesting to me how many things I've realized about myself as I've talked about myself, done speeches, things of that nature. Attention was the big one. Like, holy crap. I didn't run lemonade stands. I watched cars to watch people. Holy crap. I wasted the, wasted the first three hours of baseball card show to watch what people were doing with their attention. That is something I didn't know until like four or five or six years ago. Now that you're talking about your career and things of that nature, when do you think you, at this point, right this minute, when do you think you woke up and said, holy crap, I gotta get out of this? I think when I was, I was 10 years old, I remember uh, just something happened where it seemed like really desperate and had an epiphany that if, if uh, things don't go in a different direction, they're not gonna end well. I, and I remember- at What year were you born? I was 1974. Got it. So in yeah. 84. 84. Okay. I um, a bunch of things happened in my mother's life, and yes. you know she was sick. Like and well, she she, she was very love. depressed uh-huh. and uh, just sick. And Did she date other guys? No, no. Okay. We grew up. Uh, like that's interesting you asked that. Yeah. yeah, we were kind of a unit, and yep. and uh, for some reason around that time, I remember I had been in a bus accident, and I was standing at the ocean looking at the waves, thinking like, okay, this is this is not going to end well, and and I kind of I think that was the beginning of the me being a little bit of a loner. And deciding, like, I need to figure out a way out of and this situation. And when you say loner, do you, this is just an interesting question. Yeah. I mean, this, is, we, this is what's fun about this. I've never really gone into some of these places with you. I'm getting uncomfortable. I know you I should think, because yeah. I'm about to go there. <laughs> loner as in, like, okay, not that I don't want to be like my brothers, yeah. but when you're number four, and I'm listening, and I've never thought about it this way, but we're putting on a show here. You want yeah. to be on a show, here you go. <laughs> do you mean loner, like, and by the way, it's interesting because I have a version of this too, which is like, and I've had such good things that I'm the only. It's just like sometimes you just go inside your head. Yeah, actually, now I've never thought about what do I mean by that word, but now I do. <clears throat> we used to go to the emergency room all the time for healthcare because we we had nothing, and that became kind of our doctor. Uh-huh. And it's the time when I started realizing that these are intractable problems. You don't use that word at ten, but like, there's no answer to this, and that you have to kind of take matters into your own hands. Not like I had the answers at 10, but I definitely had the problem at 10. Yes. And um, and then something happened, back to pattern recognition. Uh, when I was a kid, 
My mother actually got a GED as an adult and she was able to go to college. She did really well. And around the time that I was in eighth grade, I said, wait a second, if she was able to go to college as an adult, kind of by accident, if I did this on purpose, then I could get out of the situation even faster. So, sc- and, so and listen, I grew up at the same time as you yeah. did. Like school became a gateway out. Yeah, school became a mind. gateway out, but also um, unnecessary. Like it just didn't add up. Like, okay, I have a desperate circumstance. We're very poor. We need to move quickly. She's getting progressively, you know, sicker, right? Um, and then there's this side path, which is if you actually drop out at 16 and do well enough, you can go to college. So that was probably the first most unconventional decision I ever made that everybody said, you're crazy. Like you're, you're throwing it away. And when I say loner, it's the, when I started to cultivate this voice in my head, like, Hey, wait a minute, I have a plan and I don't need anybody else to agree to it yeah. because they're not looking at the apartment and they don't, have, not, context. They don't have context. You always it's, say it all the time, which I love. Nobody, nobody had a window. First of all, when you're a kid. You're trying to wear Jordache jeans or gas. I'm dating myself, right? <laughs> you're doing everything you can to conceal your shame. Sure. So when everybody was saying, you're insane to drop out of high school, I was like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Now, when I made the move and I dropped out of Cardoza High School at 16, and I was like, okay, now, now you got to. Which now you gotta- is, you know, right now, if people drop out of high school, like in 2018, 2019, and they've got a plan, there's a level of like, oh, that might be an entrepreneur that's going to go do something. When you and I were growing up, anybody that dropped out of high school was a hundred percent certified loser. Oh, forget about it. Right. Yes. I, and it's funny that when I remember like you when even I, just went back to like New York talk. Just oh no, now, when I used to forget about you it. You did well when I when I, I did I <laughs> it like sent you back there. <laughs> I did I was, Queens. That was the most Queensy thing. Real. I've been hanging no, out for Queens. That was the most Queensy like it literally just <laughs> that moment just put you back in there. So I remember, or now I'm going to take it real. I remember sitting on the steps. First of all, you have to return all your textbooks when you drop out of high school, back then at least. So you have to go class to class. And I remember walking into my science teacher's class, Mr. Rosenthal, if you're out there, it's stuck. And I went to bring back my textbook. And he goes, you know, Higgins, like, what a shame. What a waste. Yeah. And he goes, you know, I remember he told me, uh, I'll see you at McDonald's. Yeah. And at the time, I did work at McDonald's. I said, well, if you see me at McDonald's, because I own it. That was all talk. Yeah, I yeah. went out, sat on the steps of Cardoza, smoked a butt, because now I wasn't yeah. going to get picked up by yeah. the Truman police at that yeah. point. Yeah. And I thought, damn, like that was a ballsy move. <laughs> and, and, and so what happened next? I executed. Okay. I said, I, so I know what I'm did right. you do? I went, I started taking a GD classes for like a week, and yep. I was like, all right, this is not for me. Okay. You're allowed to take it on standby if you show up. Okay. I went to Springfield Gardens High School okay. in uh, Queens. I went on standby, took my GD. Took the SATs a couple of weeks later. And within three months, I enrolled in Queens College at 16. Okay. Then, just to prove a point, went back to my prom at high school as president of the debate team. And I was like, how do you like them apples to date myself? Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, so I, that's a, to me, that's probably one of the most important things that ever happened in my life. Because uh, everything you talk about, you don't have context, so I'm not going to listen to you because your opinion doesn't matter because you don't have the full story. I mean, that is just... Right? <laughs> I have a plan. And if I have a plan and I believe in the plan, that's more important than anything else that's sure. going on, right? And I have pattern recognition skills that maybe set me apart. So trust in them, right? Yep. That they can get, get you where, to, where you want to go. And to your point about how you get judged by being a dropout, I knew that I'm going to have to make sure that the, that the rest of the track record can overcome that one decision. So I have well, to spend... It's like, it's like being a six-round pick. Right. You're judged for being a six-round pick until you go to the Hall of Fame. <laughs> exactly. So like, law, it's funny you said, law school was my Hall of Fame. Because I was like, so I came up with this, like, all right, I'll go to law school. Makes you know, sense. And I'll do as bad as on law review. It was, you know, top of the class, whatever. I went through four years of law school at night. And as soon as I graduated, I never even took the bar. I said, okay, well, I cleaned that up. And, and then I, what happened? Well, all in between, yeah. my career was taken off, right? So because I dropped out early, got great jobs early. Like what? Um, like I actually interested. You don't know? So no. I... While I was doing that, um, I was working as a reporter for the Queen's Tribune. Okay. And people would send me their problems. I created a little column called the Trib Action Desk. Okay. And they would send me their problems about things they were doing. And they were mundane issues. Yes. But I would take the mundane and make it very interesting. Yes. You know, some, some guy in, in Hamilton Beach, Queens, when the city had built a bridge next to his house. And uh, the bridge had started destroying the foundation. And he had an animal mar- menagerie and it ended up blowing up in yeah. New York papers. Like yeah. things like I would take these crazy stories. I drive around my little Nissan Maxima with the broken radiator like all and night who, long. And who like took note of that? And uh, your next a lot of different reporters. Daily News did a big profile on me, you know, called me a real action hero, you know, and uh, it started happening, started happening. And then ultimately, um, Mayor Giuliani gave me my first kind of big job. What were you doing before Giuliani? 
Um, I was doing the, the did you do like a dot com thing like Cosmo? What that was, was in between. Yeah, what was that? Um, it was uh, Cosmo dot yeah, Cosmo. Yeah. Cosmo. It was yeah. still amazing. It was worth a, you were worth a trillion dollars. I was worth a trillion. Point. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. I was so rich. Ten thousand options. Help me right here because this is where all the kids <laughs> like you know I keep t- like I just can't wait for the world to melt. Yeah, as you know, I don't like when you say that. I know yeah. you get we, worried. We I get pumped. Together, yes, right? yeah, yeah, I know. Right. But like, I'm very. I'm still, I still have like PTSD. Yes, from I know. The but mattress. I'm ready. Yeah, because weirdly. I'm in the well, I think you just want to get I'm back like, there. I'm like, no, no, I don't want to <laughs> lose it. I want to navigate the storm. Yeah, you, you, you like, like the big reveal. I'm done with the big reveal. No, I get it. But here's the good news in this scenario: you got your own other things, but you'll be able to watch. I'll be like, I'm just hang right here. <laughs> it's watch okay, that. All right. Um, you know, right now a lot of kids are either doing well. I was at a conference yesterday, and I talked where it's a lot of videographers, a lot of vloggers, a lot of influencers. I'm like, guys, you do understand the thirty nine thousand dollars you're making this year in brand deals on Instagram photos goes away when the economy gets tight, because Coca Cola gets tight. It's cruel of you to and, tell them you know, what's happening. No, it's yeah. the single best thing That's I can do, point. right? Because everybody's <laughs> living in fantasy yeah, land. It's true. You lived in fantasy land with your Cosmo stock and already thought about what was going to happen, and it all went to dead zero. Well, that's what I was. About. I learned something at Cosmo that was so Let's important, go. right? Teach. So I so so Teach, I Matt. so I go to Cosmo. Okay, I will. Cosmo, one of the biggest internet companies at the time, yep. raised three hundred million dollars in nineteen ninety eight. It would deliver everything Let's to you in under. Andy. Deliver everything to you in under an hour. It's actually an amazing company, yeah, last right? Last mile. Last mile. Ten thousand employees. Ten cities. By I the way, here we are, twenty years later, still no last mile. Still no last another, mile. Another another thing people need to learn. And interesting that the business could have been profitable at an average order of twenty four dollars, two point five orders per hour, and there was no smartphone making those orders. That's I just, right. I, anyway, it's yeah. burning in my head. Right. But what was interesting? The signs were everywhere towards the end, and I remember thinking, we we got somebody joined the company as our CFO at the time, and he he had a. And huge, what were you doing? I was a director of comms. Keep going. So I did the road show, right, the whole yeah. bit. So this, I won't say who the person was, but they quit this massive job at a moment when I'm saying the signs are everywhere that we are about to go under. And it was completely seduced by the all upside the of the equity. Mm-hmm. And here I am, the, the, uh, Giuliani offers me a chance to become the youngest press secretary in New York City history, for which I'd have to leave my trillion dollars of options. And I had to- None of it my, was vested? Well, no, none of it was vested, right? It was sort of you know, locked up. But I had to make, okay, here's this person who's got this big job making this decision to join the company at the exact moment that I feel like we're only weeks away from total imminent you know, decline. And yet I have to decide to walk away. So I, and I made the right choice. I made more money selling the gear on eBay you know, than I did you know, at the yeah. company with the options. Yeah. But the point of that story is trust your instincts. Like don't, don't outsource your judgment to somebody who has less facts. What was the max value of all of those stocks on paper? I mean, a few million dollars. Right. I mean, this, I never but, tried to get too close to it because yeah, it never But never that was happened. like, you know. Yeah, no, I won. Right. I was, I was rich. And then went to zero. <laughs> yeah, it went to zero. Yeah. It's going to happen to so many people soon. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> What's interesting about the collapse of 01 and 07 was there wasn't a maturity of social media. What I'm unbelievably worried about and why I keep talking about it and I will continue to talk about it basically every day is we have a bunch of people that are posturing of success on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter every single day. Right. And they're all and 99% are going to lose cuz they're over leveraged, which means that they're going to have to deal with the fact of that judgment at scale. Like yeah. you weren't posting. Like we can't look at your Twitter from it's 2002 talking big way. game at being at Nobu, right? Mm-hmm. Because you had 2 million in the bank as a 20 something in stock. But that's what was happening. But do you think that? Do you think the cycle's the same now? I remember companies 100%. were getting funded. Pets.com, yes, all this I do was think about mind share. I do. Are people I getting funded on mind I share? I do believe now? people that are claiming on Instagram right now that they're building the next Supreme or the next Instagram, and every picture during the summer is in the Hamptons on a swan. When they go work at at Chase in two years because they're out of business, that's going to hurt. Mm. Yes, I do. I think that is a problem. Okay, what are we gonna do when that all collapses? Well, we're gonna make a lot of money yeah, okay, because okay. we're preparing for that and are building a machine. VaynerMedia is built in a way, like all the margin I don't deliver is predicated on capturing the growth when Poland Springs goes from a hundred million to a $29 million budget and they have to make that work. Yeah. So, th- you know, but but it's not like I'm like he 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 being secretive. I'm just I'm telling people what I'm doing. My biggest advice always to my audience is watch what I'm doing, not what I'm saying. Because then you'll really know what the hell's going on. What's going on? I'm eating crow running this goddamn company because I know how fruitful it will be when inevitably. Well, that's what I always say. I always think the one thing that you don't give enough insight into is just how hard you work as an operator, how much you spend all your time, just like, and how right you are on trends. Uh, business trends, yeah. right? About what an incredible insight not to blow smoke, but you are. And from that first time we met in a bagel store, 
Right, that's what I saw. Why don't we tell Gary. that story? I think so. So l- l- let's go quickly because okay. I want to get yeah. Stuff. I get bored of the you bio go, story. All Giuliani, right. you're with him during 9/11. That's an episode in itself. That, yeah. I mean, that that you should be putting content about just to it. Just you should put it for your you know like just for generations in the future. Yeah. It's just interesting stuff. Like to be at the hip of Mayor Giuliani during 9/11 is one of the unique lives in America. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. Like you, it's it's yours. Thus, it's hard for you to see it. And I don't know how big that team was or wasn't, but you're talking about 40, 20, help me here, jump in, 19, 27. What was the core circle of Team Giuliani on 9-11? It's probably, yeah, it's 25 people. I was doing Think about that. Uh, Out of 300 plus Americans who, uh, you know, there's some young people who didn't, it's crazy now to think about how many people, 9-11, what are you talking, 17 years ago? 17 years ago, man, it's crazy that 22-year-olds don't know. Yeah, they don't. Like, uh, how old are you? 24. You know, like it starts ha- to take on you were a Pearl here? Harbor quality, right? we're, 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 How old are you? But in Houston, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure. Like you were in America yeah, on 9/11. Yes, yes, I was. What What do you think about when I say 9/11? Do you remember anything? Hardly anything. How old are you? Man, you look great, <laughs> Brooke. How old are you? <laughs> 22. You know, it, yeah. What do you? But how? On the TV. But like for you. 9-11 is like... Is it like Pearl Harbor? It's like or Vietnam. Is it, yeah, is it like, like Vietnam? It means or? nothing. Like it meant something, but you're five. My, my grandmother was in the room. She was yeah. Right, so that's what you remember. Yeah. But like it's crazy, anyway, nonetheless. Yeah. For most, you know, like it's crazy to think that you were so close to like probably the signature moment of the majority of people's lives in, in American yeah, I mean, I history. Standing, I was standing outside when the first building collapsed. Yep. Right? We were setting up to do, one thing about Giuliani, he, he handled a crisis by letting everybody know that you know it was under control and that he was, he was got there. This. So right before the uh, first tower collapsed, I was standing outside setting up a press conference so that he could do what he normally would do, which yep. is say that, that we've got this. Yep. And then it just was so clear that this is, you know, this is a, this a is, war zone. This yeah. is unlike, but in the beginning, you remember? Yeah. It wasn't clear. Yeah, it was like the a first plane report, hit. Plane yeah. hit was it a Cessna? Yeah. And so for me, that was a, that began a two year chapter, right? Because I was there from that moment, stayed with Giuliani as press secretary, managing the global response to the attack, which became its own obligation, right? How do we telegraph what happened here? Yeah. How do we enlist the support of the world? Yeah. Um, and then um, I became the first employee of the rebuilding. So you, I arrived with a cell phone and a massive federal budget with a group of people to start rebuilding. I spent two years of my life. I moved down there. I would sit on the roof of my building uh, on Chamber Street and write speeches you know, while everything was still you know, going on. So it was just basically that day really lasted for two years. That's why it's hard for me to tell the story because it's still kind of a blur. Like I don't totally understand it. I haven't gone back and looked at all the footage and understood the impact. And, and then what happened I've next? Seen. So I did... Two years, I, I decided I was going to see it through until we had a design for the memorial and the uh, Freedom Tower. And then I transitioned uh, to the New York Jets. That's right. That's where I met So how did that Gary happen? Um, <clears throat> the New York Jets were looking for somebody to help them build a stadium. Yes. Uh, because they never had here. one of their own. Here. Literally, in New York. No, no. Oh, yeah, here. Here. All right, here. Like, yeah. literally, <clears throat> That's here. Right. Here. This Hudson Yards project. So we, we waged an epic, you know, Comms death war. battle, right? Like, spent... Uh, both sides probably almost a hundred million dollars fighting. Uh, Cable Vision yep. uh, went to war to stop it. Thank you. Madison Square Garden. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. So that lasted probably two years, and ultimately, how close did it get? It got really close. We had a majority of the city council supporting it. Uh, uh, for everybody who's listening, yeah. this is obviously very emotional for me. Yeah, the Jets yeah, wanted you. to build way more for me than you. I don't give well, a shit how involved you were. That, that, <laughs> emotionally, emotionally, way more yes. This this part is emotional yeah. for me. Fair enough, but we are lit- <clears throat> literally the office building we're in right now is in the spot that was battled over in the early 2000s about where the New York Jets almost built their stadium, which would have been in Manhattan. And as somebody who's a Jets fan in a town that is very giants out, you can imagine having the actual stadium in Manhattan was obviously very attractive. Now I'm a Jersey boy and I love that it's out there, but it was an attractive proposition of the Jets being the Manhattan. And it was gonna Manhattan. be home to the Olympics. That's exactly Remember, right. We, yep, and they of course. killed the Olympic bid. So, so hard to explain the convoluted political process, but it was a, a war of television ads and tens of thousands of union Oh, it was crazy. It was crazy, and I ran that fight, and then it died on the steps of the Capitol when Shelly Silver, who's now going to jail. Uh, Is that true? Yeah, yeah. Shelly's been indicted, know, convicted, and yeah, well, see the bitterness last. Yes, yeah, yeah, of okay. course. I'm going to hold on to it. Yep. Um, and we lost. Yep. Right? So then... Um, 
the uh, and the reason why the Jets chose me, they needed somebody who had that background in city it. politics and whatnot. And, and what then, did you come in as? I come in as like VP of, of strategy. And then what? And then every other job, yep. eventually ending up as EVP of the business, running yep. the business of the team. Yes. Right? How long were you? With, how long were you with the Jets? Uh, eight years. Man, that's yeah, a, I started that's a real the, run. I mean, I was I started the Jets when I was probably twenty eight. And and Hofstra was headquarters. Well, headquarters in Manhattan. Hot, but, but really, you, I was in Manhattan. Yeah. They were out in Hofstra. Right. And then, then moved to Florida. Yeah, and then I ran that process. Yep. Right. So I, I ran the process to figure out how to build a practice facility in New Jersey. Yep. Uh, and then relocated in New Jersey out of anger. And Matt, we met because <laughs> what? Why? We met because I was trying to sell you a suite. You were like, I know. you know, we have this like pinup at the at the team at the time. Who could afford a suite but isn't buying one? Right, wine library. Yeah, and you were like, you were you were you were you know you were target number. It was, it, it, and, and that bagel store was a target rich environment, right? So I had to come out. Such and an see unbelievable it. story, really quick, because I want to get into other parts of his career and it's about Matt. I want to get no, into I the like Shark Tank the story, stuff, yeah. but it. Look, so it's interesting. Ahead. Yeah. Ahead. So no, because it's, it's it's the Genesis story, right? So I'm, I'm running Wine Library. This is as me and AJ are plotting Vayner Media, but nobody knows. So I'm actively just running Wine Library. I get an email from the Jets, which always gets responded to right away. <laughs> and the president wants to meet you, and I'm like, hell yes. And we went to Bagel Smith in, on on Springfield is Avenue in yeah. uh, Springfield, New Jersey. That's yes. right. That's right. So I'm going to sell Gary a suite, which is not something that you love to do as a as an executive, yeah. right? It's a hard thing to sort of sell. I go to meet Gary uh, Jeff Fernandez. I'd asked yes. us to do it, right? I go to meet Gary. Uh, in a bagel store, and then the first ten minutes, I'm listening to you with your frenetic energy and your predictions, and I didn't, I didn't follow you on on yep. on uh, on Wine Library, but I always remember. I always think about the second ten minutes, right? Because that's when all this magic happened. Gary started telling. Uh, all these stories about how the world was going to unfold. And to give you an example, I started making predictions that, you know, Matt, in another couple of years, everything is going to be about social media and digital content. But more importantly, um, content is going to be democratized and everybody is going to become their own content publisher. And because of that, these uh, corporations are like big battleships. They're not going to be able to manage that in-house. They're never going to have enough sophistication to figure out how to how to go ahead and tap into that. And there's going to be a new type of agency that'll be born that that will figure out how to manage that. And I'm the guy to do it. Interesting, sounds legit. And my brother AJ and I are gonna as soon as he graduates because he's 12, <laughs> we're gonna launch this big company, and I'm gonna be a billionaire. I'm gonna buy the Jets. You fucking tell everybody I'm gonna buy the Jets, right? So you know, it's sounds and going right. back to pattern recognition, smoking the butt at uh, on high school, yes. right? I, over those years, I started ref trusting myself that when I see a pattern playing out and I see somebody speaking the truth who's got the courage to get it right and it resonates with me, I don't care if anybody else in the world knows if they're right or not. So within those first, those second 10 minutes, I was like, oh, Gary is sitting in the stream of information and data. He's opening himself up to the world and is starting to see the patterns. And he's right. And I don't know if you remember too, you started predicting, you know, I think Facebook is going to yeah, be mad. It, it, all the things that you-, you I know, wish you, I was recording that meeting. Yeah, no, that it would, would look be, really I, I, good on me right now. It, it really yeah. would, yeah. So that, and that's why I tell everybody, you know, and it's cliche, but you know where the puck is going. So for, at that meeting, we did a deal, right? Yeah. Uh, a couple things: take a Jets player who doesn't deserve to be famous and make him Twitter famous. That's right. That was mission number one. And if you succeed, we'll give you uh, four Jets tickets to become the first client. I know others claim this, yep. but I'm going to claim I am the first yes. client. Yep. And two, make me the guy in sports who gets it, so I can get a huge job, right? <laughs> <laughs> Total self dealing. Check, 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 and check. And none of those early articles do I credit Gary, which I no, think you even framed one of them so you give me shit about yeah, it, right? I it was do. the journal article. Yes. So, Matt Higgins, Mastermind Social Media Rise of the New York Jets. <laughs> exactly. And I'm reading it for I'm it's somewhere, in, I'm somewhere in here. Nope, not in there. By the way, even in Fast Company, I pulled up an article today. <laughs> I love so, it. but remember, we had dinner in, uh, in Chatham with, in Chatham Kerry, with Rhodes. Kerry Rhodes. Kerry Rhodes, yep. Mr. One Hollywood. Of my, one of my favorite players of all time. And you made him. You Massive. Owed. Kerry Rhodes at one point was like, literally the second or first most followed football player as a safety for the New York Jets on Twitter. The Jets were the number one team followed on Twitter in 2009 and 10, period. And, and so, yeah, we did a lot of great work. It was a lot of fun. I remember okay. my first meeting, I was like, we just drafted Sanchez. And I was like, I don't need, like, because sports marketing is like market around the stars. And I was like, I want to make the punter famous. I want to make the people that cover coverage on special teams. And I still believe that to this day. I still believe to this second, the biggest vulnerability in sports marketing is they give too much power to the individual athlete 
and the athlete should be doing that. Everybody should be doing what they should be doing. But anyway, right. it was a great but remember, run. But remember, but you know, remember how hard it was in those early days. Like you would get a cease and desist letter for marketing on MySpace. Of course. I remember in the, I think 2009, I got a cease and desist letter from the NFL. Like you're not allowed to market on MySpace, right? So it wasn't easy to go ahead. No. And, and the players were still grappling with, am I allowed to use Twitter? 100%. I mean, actually, not even grappling. It wasn't even allowed, right? So we were we were we were breaking down walls back we in the were. day. We to were. give ourselves credit. And then your career transitioned again. <clears throat> and, I, and by the way, I don't think I've ever told you this story. I came to a Jets practice during preseason and you said, hey, there's something brewing in my career. Yeah. And I remember, I remember thinking. You remember that? We I remember very the well. Line. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I remember thinking, no, 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 Matt. I like you at the Jets. Right, right. You're my I like the Jets. <laughs> yeah, don't leave. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you were right. Yeah. No, I, I like you. I always had the desire to be an entrepreneur. Yep. And I had all those ideas that were percolating in my head. And I think at, you, you reach a tipping point, right? At two o'clock in the morning, like, oh, I could, I could run this. We were talking about creating a fund together. Yep. Gary's got all this great insight. If yep. only we could monetize yep. it. Jesse Darris, our partner in my PR firm, yep. I knew that he needed to be running his own firm. Right. Just all these ideas. And it just, it reached a tipping point. How yeah. long did Ross, Steve Ross, who now we're gonna transition to, yeah. over to Dolphins, who brought you on board, how long was he courting you as an executive? Was that a quick courtship? I don't know this story. Is yeah, I think, I think I had made a, uh, I was going through a lot of personal transitions in my life and I had to make the decision like, okay, if I don't transition out of this job, I'm never gonna leave it. Like sometimes it's a, tough. When you have a job that everybody in the world, you know, wants or a lot of people want, it's very hard to listen to your inner voice and say, that's great that this is the job you want, but I've run my course. Yeah, I've been so, here eight years. Yeah, eight years. And if, you know, the, the office on the 50 yard line and the, Private plane yeah. and everything. Very hard to let that go. So I made a decision. I was gonna, I was gonna transition. And when that got out there, that's when I started to have conversations with Steve. Different people. And Steve is a maverick. I sure. mean, he's he's sitting in that uh, in that room of NFL owners, and he's just of a different breed. Yeah, and, no question. And, and he had all these ideas that he wanted to pursue around the team that resonated with me. And I had all these ideas that I wanted to 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 put to work and. And he supported it, right? I mean, in ways that are looking back are kind of breathtaking, right? And and including becoming partners with you yep. and building this huge international soccer tournament that we have and drone racing and you know on and on. But that was six years ago that we created RSE. So in the, to speed it up, and then we're going into Q and A. In the last six years that you created RSE, um, what are the what are the highlights? So you start this company along yep. with Steve. I started a company with Steve. You're also you also become an executive on the Dolphin side, right? right? And right, and, and so you were an employee on that side and executive. Yeah, so the the the, the oversee the Dolphins yep. on the business side, put yep. in place a great team, yep. but let it run itself. Sure. And we have an amazing CEO named yep. Tom Garfinkel. Right. So that took care of itself. Right. But let's build an ecosystem around the team that yep. could either help drive value or extract value from. Right. Yep. So some of the early deals you were on that first PowerPoint. Yep. It's amazing looking at my first pitch deck. Yes. There were four ideas and you were on that. Yes. And look at where we are. Yep. Jesse Darris was on that list. Yep. Creating an international soccer business was on that list because we're in Miami. Yep. Fast forward, we have the largest soccer tournament in the world. And I remember sitting with Steve at his desk about three months in going through the pitch and he's like, that's a lot of stuff. You sure you're going to do it? And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, you'll see. We do it. So since then, what are the highlights? I think seeing in somebody something that maybe even they don't see in themselves yet. And extracting it and weaponizing. I, I love Matt, it. Do you do you believe that Shark Tank? I'm jumping here a little bit. Put you on because you've been so good at picking entrepreneurs and investing in them. And and when I look at and, and I feel like I am one. But then I think the chapter that you've had recently that has been more in the food space. And and I like I think Jesse's a real maverick of a young entrepreneur too. But the when I look at what you did with David Chang or some of the, what you're doing in food seems to be more of a pattern of what you did with me and it, and then you did it within a genre of food. Yeah. Talk to me about that. So I think what what So give people context. Yeah. The company is invested in whom what company? Okay, so we're um, four spaces, sports and entertainment, drone racing, international soccer, huge tournament, um, food and lifestyle. So we own uh, we incubated Resi together. Yep. Uh, David Chang is my partner, um, Milk Bar, and Pizza, Bluestone Lane, um, a bunch of different sort of large, fast casual companies and fine when dining. When I look at the CEO of Blue Star Stone, excuse yeah, me. Nick, uh, yeah. Yep, uh, and, P and Pizza, yeah. who's a real amazing Amazing, talent. yeah, David. Pizza Profit. I mean, these are, these are, you know, the Blue Stone guy, but they're dynamic in all different ways. Yeah, they are. I think, so you asked why would Shark Tank want me on? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think it's because, just because I know a lot of entrepreneurs are watching and when you're on this season, 
I think it's super, you know, it, it makes me, I'm so happy you're on because I think there's, I think what they've done with guests, whether it's been Ashton or Saka or like they've gone for just Alex Rodriguez. There's been a lot of front facing people. Yeah. That's true. Right? You're a, you know, you're disproportionately the least famous guest shark. Which I love. I always say that my favorite comment, I think I sent this to you, when it was announced, somebody commented on ABC's page saying, but he only has 400 followers. Yeah. And I wrote back, I said, 401? Question mark. That was, like, almost, like, I was, like, that was I, almost I, as good as <laughs> when I was on Planet of the Apps and the article was, and in a new show, Apple's first original show, the guests are, the, the, the judges are Gwyneth Paltrow, Will I Am, uh, uh, Jessica Alba, and others. <laughs> and others. <laughs> By the way, I'm, I'm showing up a lot in the promos, others too. <laughs> yeah. I've decided not to be offended because I, now, I, like you, I'm starting to love the big reveal. 100%. So why did they put me on? I think my, my day job and my hobby is helping people transcend because I was that kid that had all this potential and then had to break through in order to transcend to what I was meant to be. So for me, there's something magical about unlocking that butterfly that's in everybody. When you pick, when you pick like, entrepreneur, I apologize, because yeah. I'm looking at the time and I want to get some calls okay. in, so I apologize. Let me give an insight to the people that always get mad at me for interrupting. These are time slotted, unlike mo- other people whose entire life is being a podcaster and they have unlimited time and they do post-production, we slot them in because we have busy peeps and we have to stay with them. And we do this to each other all the time, so. That's true. Yeah. Matt, when you've been wrong about entrepreneurs, yep. because you've been betting on entrepreneurs over the last half decade plus pretty aggressively, and it is now becoming your brand, and, and inevitably, you, especially with the association with me, especially with Shark Tank, you are in for a decade of people reaching out and saying, I'm the next David Chang. Like That's gonna be your life, at least until you change it. Right. You're, it is very clear for me from the outside. Yep. Because I think the thing that people will be- I like fine. that life. Yeah, I'm I mean, okay it's a that. very interesting thing. Like, I think one thing, even if, I don't know if you guys are picking up on this new nuance, and this is true with my dad and my brother, let alone a majority investor into my company, the, the key plug to the relationship, Matt will tell you that it is shocking how much and how little we actually talk business, right? Like, everyone's so busy. Yep. And just I'm the kind of entrepreneur that's not so detailed, let's have a meeting every month to like review what's happening. But what, so I'm actually, it's been fun for me to watch you go through this process the last 100 days in anticipation of Shark Tank. I'm like, wow, you know, it is very clear what Matt's life is gonna look like for the next half decade, which is people are just gonna pitch him left and right of like, I'm the next entrepreneur that you should bet on. So to that point, I, when you've been wrong in the last six years, even if it's not a bet you made where you wanted to make the bet, and you didn't because the price was too high or they didn't take your money and then you got to watch her or him win or lose. When you've been wrong, why do you think you've been wrong? Uh, it's the number one reason, there are minor reasons. Number one is when I thought that the power of the idea would eclipse whatever flaws are in the founder. It's when I decided to overlook the fact that the jockey doesn't have what it takes and say, well, the idea is so good. The it, horse it is so special. Yeah, I, every mistake, I'm yeah. sure there are others, every mistake has Me always been, has been about the idea the idea will eclipse the founder and that's never true. So it's about the people. That's really interesting you say mm. that because now that I was thinking that might is, is what you said because it's been I've been very intrigued by this chapter in the food space because I really personally from afar liked the bets. Yeah. And I do think they're different <clears throat> than the kind of things you were looking at because we looked at a lot of stuff together when we had Vayner RCR fund together. I do think there's a maturity in the way that you're picking jockeys yeah well i'm picking special first right i'm picking ideas that are potentially scalable right i don't want to pick something that could just be a couple of units as you and i learned the hard way small ideas and big ideas take the same exact amount of work it's an interesting secret secret of life right you would assume that there'd be a massive increase in work to make a big idea same exact game which is exciting because that means you can keep leveling up and do big stuff but um i'm backing special backing scalable and backing people who have the confidence and the humility to make it work, right? Because if you don't have humility, you'll never pivot. Right. And if you don't have confidence, you'll never be comfortable to have humility, yeah, I think that's right. right? I think that's Sorry, exactly we'll take right. some, want to take some calls? Yeah, we're gonna take some calls. Take some but calls. I think that's right. I think that contradiction of confidence and humility is something I talk a lot about. I believe in it. Can I give a shout out to my wife, Sarah? Is over, who over that's in fine. That's all right. She, is she the confidence or the humility? <laughs> She's the whole package. That's fine. What I'm, are you? Uh, uh, I'm only, I'm, I'm, I'm inadequate. She backfills. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this? <laughs> Michael. This is Michael. Michael, this is Gary Vaynerchuk. You're on the Ask Gary V Show with Matt Higgins. How are you? Outstanding. I All cannot right. believe that I actually got the call in and 
Hey, Matt, how's it going? I'm doing great. I'm glad to hear you're outstanding. Oh, uh, <laughs> so my question. Go ahead. We're here. I've known each other for three, four years now. Hold on, hold on. Brother, you chopped off for a second. Are you in a good, what, what's his name again? Michael, two things. One, your voice scared the shit out of everybody watching. When you were laughing, it was a very evil vo- laugh. We're all very scared. <laughs> um, but number two, you cut off when you asked your question, so ask it again, please. So I said I was a big fan of both you, Gary, and I've known Matt for about three, four years now. So my awesome. question is for Matt, when you acquire these companies or invest in these companies, what are you looking at? Are you looking for growth? Are you looking for future sale? What is your overall, as Gary would say, your macro approach? Well, I'm, I'm a little different than a firm or some PE shop because I'm, I'm partnered with Steve Ross. So the philosophy is we don't worry about the exits. The exits will be a byproduct of success. We don't force our founders to do that. So we're looking for something that can be a, a, an inherently big business, maybe not in the first you know, version 1.0 of me, but certainly version 3.0 now, a big business, and that there is an inevitable path to exit, but we're not going to focus on it, right? So a business that could be sold, that could exit, but it's all about growth. It's not about distributing cash flow. It's not about you know, financial engineering and, and uh, you know, Excel sheets, as Gary says. It's just about growth. Excellent. And the final question I have, and I know not a lot of a lot of questions, but final question is, how is a person that runs probably and owns probably one of the most storied franchises of the Dolphins partner with the most <laughs> craziest Jets fan <laughs> out there? Well, I've been looking to sell our stake in the firm for a long time, so that's <laughs> the answer. Is I'm raising my profile to find a buyer. Um, well, we just don't talk about it. I mean, it's we don't I don't razz him about it because he's yeah, so Matt, emotional. Matt, I do not give him shit because it's an area I don't want to go to. And right? and I don't say too much either because one time when I was getting on Ross real heavy in a meeting, he looked at me and he said, "You're a fan of the team. I own the team," and that hurt. Yeah, that was pretty. And ep- epic. I pretty much decided I would never really go anywhere. Again. He did to me what I like to yeah, do to it others. Like so yeah, it's like a hundred percent. But you know, to give some insight, so when we when we when we play the Jets, right? Gary won't even come over and say hello, right? Like you, That's you right. won't you won't even. You know, it's like it's like what do you work there? I mean, what, what's yeah, this, like this, I, we, you're, you're pretty. You're, I mean. You won't even Steve shake our always, hands Steve, in the sidelines. Yeah, Steve always goes, you're tribal. He always yells at me, you're tribal. I mean, look, one of the worst, if not the single worst business decision in my life, it, financially. I, I offered you. Yeah, yeah. Steve and Matt, in our transaction of them investing in Boehner, there was, a, there was equity in the Dolphins offered, and we went a different route. We had the soccer idea, then we did the fund, but, but the multiple of the growth, like I, I mean, I lost tens of millions of dollars in not, by being a Jets fan. Big mistake, as they would say in Pretty Woman. Well, I, I hope to see you on uh, the Jets. Are you coming down for the Jets Dolphins game? Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I'm not. I'm in LA doing something, so I'm on a red eye like meeting right now with my. I actually had that conversation today. I would say very likely. Yes, you could. Almost, I guess he's not I taking Ross one year. with you, Matt. Right? Yeah. Yes, Matt will be there. Yep, Thanks for calling, brother. Thanks for calling. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, I think. Look, I think that what's super interesting about the jockey horse conversation is that, like, it is very clear to me. Like, what, I, I mean, I've not been doing much investing. We did our fund. Yeah. We, you know, I've been kind of very head down in building the Vayner machine. I think things are overvalued in general for me for early stage. I think some of the later stuff is a little more interesting. Um, but the jockey is where I'm at. And I think the next phase that you and I will go through together is control. Like, if, you know, like, if I'm backing Gary V directly, it's 100%. much more interesting than so a term sheet more. to some anonymous company. Nathan? A hundred percent. Like, like I'm only into control now. That's yeah. the whole macro thing of Vayner, right? Like, when we buy brands in the future, it's gonna run through. It's all control. Like, I don't want to guess. Are we teasing out our next move? Or I mean, I've been very public okay. about it. Very <laughs> plan. Nathan, it's Gary Vaynerchuk. You're on the Ask Gary V Show with Matt Higgins. How Hi, are you? Wow, what a freaking honor! How are you guys? Good, Nathan. Where are you from? Uh, I just mainly was calling because I wanted some uh, advice from two winners, and what had happened is in the last year or so, we had kind of blown up our Facebook Live selling sports cards, and I've kind of gotten a little overwhelmed. We passed the $5 million mark, and I'm starting to have to handle employees and things like that, and trying to take that next step into that $10 million range in 2019, and I'm just a little bit 
overwhelmed trying to and Nathan, figure uh, out. Nathan, are, did you? I just want to start thinking while you're talking. Did you say a sports bar? Uh, baseball cards. Baseball cards. Yes. Okay, this is very exciting to me. Matt, get out of here. <laughs> um, hold on. Doing five million in revenue and baseball cards. So, Nathan, real quick, where are you located? I'm in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Right. So we've interacted, right? That's correct. Cool. Yes. So this is, you're the guy I DM with a bunch, right? Like you've grown a lot in both at your retail store in the last couple of years, right? Correct. Yes. A- on the back of social media marketing advice, correct? Yes, sir. Makes me super happy. <laughs> um, okay. And so now you're saying shit. This is continuing to work, and I can feel it going to the next level. And with that comes new dynamics, which is I'm not just standing behind the counter of my store and posting on social to the scale I'm at, I've gotta bring in new employees, so now I'm getting to more of an HR human game, not just being the marketer and seller of 86, 87 Fleer basketball cards. That's exactly right, yes. And so do you hate it? Because I think one of the things that a lot of people who are watching right now have to understand, it's super okay to be in a transition where you love your craft, it was a small business, you're good at your craft, whether that's, by the way, being a lawyer or doing a landscaping business or selling baseball cards, and that when it grows, it now becomes about people management, and for a lot of people that are artists or good at their craft, there's a, I mean, I'll tell you, AJ's biggest issue in the growth of Vayner was the unbelievable non-enjoyment yeah, in managing, managing people. people. Yeah. Are you saying that you don't like it, the early tastes of it, or you're scared to fuck it up, or what? Oh no, we we I love what I do. I haven't set my alarm for the last two. No, years. no, I mean, I mean, are you? Do you not like the idea of managing people? That's right. That, I mean, <laughs> I, it's not that I hate it. It's just that it's just like anything else. I'm just starting out, and I'm not. I wouldn't say I'm very good at it right now. I'm learning as I go. When you say you're not but, good, what mistakes do you think you've made? Say it out loud because putting it out there will is a very important thing. It will help yeah. you. What do you? What mistakes uh, do you think you've made? Um, well, early on, when I gave trust to an employee, when I found that they were going to have that trust. Hey, I brother, hold on, hold on. It. It's a, it's a little muffled. That's why I thought you had a sports bar, not a baseball card. Sorry. One more time. What was it? Um, early on, I had an employee that I'd given quite a bit of trust to. Trust. And when I saw that that trust was being violated, I didn't necessarily. Fire Blame that in immediately. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't, oh, yeah, yeah. didn't fire. That, I mean, but, but I mean, way, Gary, I mean, we yeah. we commiserate about this all the time. I mean, yeah. we there's a ni- nice cliche that nobody actually follows, which is hire slow and fire fast. So the mistake that you're making is a mistake that yeah, Gary I, and I, I made. I, I I'm making hire it <laughs> extremely fast and fire slow. Oh, exactly. Like, and and and, and by the way, agonize it and as you should. Right. These but are me, human. Let me, Nathan, let me yeah. say something. When people make fun of me or critique me or we're in we intersect- make fun of each yeah, other. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I make fun of myself. I'm <laughs> yeah, like, I, mean, I, I, I'm like, When what? I do that, there is one thing that, and I think as a small business, you'll appreciate this. Brother, let me give you a humongous piece of advice, and this is for everybody. You have to sleep at night. I am thrilled to give up money every day of my life to feel better when I go to sleep. Now, that makes me not as good of an entrepreneur as I could be, because when you're on the field, you're on the field. Like, it is what it is. But don't overjudge yourself either, you know, and, and you're going through an evolution. I mean, to me, that there's nothing wrong with you trying to find your patterns on how to fire somebody right. quicker. And dirty, dirty little secret, Nathan, every single entrepreneur and leader goes through the transition that you're talking about. And the biggest lament is that they didn't act sooner when they already knew because it takes time to, to get used to that. So I would, I would just say, but nobody talks about that. Everybody talks yeah. a big game. Like, oh, yeah. I, I dealt with yeah. my staff issues yeah. right away. Nobody, nobody does. So if that's your biggest issue, you're, 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 you're doing great. What else have you fucked up up? Oh man, there's been plenty <laughs> of them. Um, this is cathartic. Let me ask you a question: What are you most right. worried? What are you most worried about going into next year as you continue to grow? Because I think you know I'm about to make sports cards very culturally popular in 2019, and all of you are going to benefit from it. So you're going to probably do more revenue next year. Oh, I know, man. I really appreciate the help too. I really do. Um, <laughs> Not grandiose the, at all. <laughs> the biggest thing that I fear is we have built this big, well, what I consider a juggernaut in our industry, and and for whatever reason. I have this fear that one day I'm going to log on and there's not 500 people watching. You know, it just goes away, whether that's 
uh, a, a war or whatever. Just he's, the economy he, so let me tell you, Matt, let me, let me help everybody who's watching. Yeah, what he? he's done is there's a, a big thing called pack breaking, which is people, basically, people buy slots in boxes of cards where you get the third pack that he opens live on Facebook or whatever live platform. And you know you can call it a form of gambling, a form of contests, but like literally, for example, there's a famous one that he didn't do and he's doing a great job, I've seen some of his, but 86, 87 Fleer with the Jordan rookie, yeah. people pay $2,000 a pack to, and, and then if you get a Jordan or in his world, like what's the most expensive pack break you've done, brother? Um, I mean, we we opened fifteen hundred dollar uh, flawless briefcases. We opened four or five last night. So right. I mean, fifteen hundred bucks a box, something like that. Yeah. So like, and and in that box, how many packs are there? Well, there's only ten individual cards. It's right. So you sold one, you one sold pack. you sold the slots of the card. So it even goes down to the. So you sold. So it was a fifteen hundred box. And how much? I just want to teach everybody about this whole business. And you you sold the, you sold the individual cards in the pack. Like the first card Matt Higgins bought, I bought the third card from the pack. How much was the slot? How much did you sell the slots for? If it's fifteen hundred retail, like if I'm selling a box to set you for fifteen hundred, if it's a, in a group break, we might charge. Uh, 164 95 so we make an extra 150 bucks for packaging up 10 things. So By the way, how brilliant made, is this idea? Oh, it's, it's super, super brilliant. brilliant. It's, it's also brilliant. super entertaining to watch. Yeah, no, it's because brilliant. Because I watch, uh, I'm not even in it. It's no, like I watching sports. It. I watch pack breaks that I'm not even in just waiting for the big card right. to be like, or the big card to come out of the pack. So, so Nathan, let me ask you a question. If people stop caring to watch you do that, why will they stop caring? When you when it keeps you up at night, Nathan. Let me give you a good. You said one example. Let me give you a headline. If a war breaks out, you're not going to give a fuck about your pack break business. <laughs> like I love yeah, when people are like Gary. I'm worried a war breaks. Out. I'm like, if a war breaks out in our country, you're going to be running to the bunkers and like I don't think like you know like the last thing you're going to be thinking about like fuck. Man, there's a war going on. New York just blew up. I don't think 500 people are going to tune into my pack break tonight. <laughs> Good news. Like going back to 9/11, everything stopped. Yep. Like if a war breaks out, that's going to be the last fucking Wait, but concern that's you the have. scenario that he's worried that was the about. First thing I, he okay, said. Well, he so goes, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I assume there's other things other than war that you're worried about. Um, I mean, really, um, not much. I mean, that's all right. So wait. So then. Up. So then. So then. Uh, what I hear is. You have the typical paranoia of a founder and a business 100%. owner who's worried it's all. I, mean, I still grapple with whether or not I made it or not. I Matt, mean, Matt, right, Nathan, like, real quick to interrupt, I'll give you an exa- perfect example. On the flight from LA this morning, I, had, I texted a client of ours. We have a, division, we have a thing at VaynerMedia called Vayner Mentors for small businesses. It's kind of like Bain & McKinsey. You pay $100,000, $300,000 for a project where we give you business advice and marketing advice to take your business to the next level. An incredible uh, young woman out of Florida with a furniture store used us. It's been rolling. Everything's going great. And then this hurricane just hit her. Right. So like, it's real too. Like Nathan, we, could, we could joke about war, it could be a hurricane. You know, Tennessee, I mean, like, I have a whole thesis of earthquakes in Tennessee. Like, you might get hit by an earthquake, right. Nathan. And the, Nathan, the fact that you're um, worried about this now, doing $5 million a year and a brilliant idea, is why you're going to be at $10 million a year. So don't lament the fact that you have this Nathan, paranoia. Nathan, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm worried about with your business is that what you're winning on is you're a first mover in it, just like I was in social media. Like, if cards continue to get as popular as I think they're going to, there's gonna be a lot of other people breaking packs and you're gonna have more competition. So you need to find another way, the way you found this, to sell sports cards. The hardest thing for people to do is put themselves out of business. I think the thing that I've always done well, which is why I don't always kick the most profit, but I always build very big businesses and I'll win in the end, is whatever's working for me, I start creating other things that could work for me because I don't want to be reliant on one move. Pack breaking is your move right now. You need to triple down on that to go to 10. At the same token, you need to start creating. Let's do it for storage uh, units so I can watch it on TV but, live. But, but uh, like, like, I'd buy into But that. like, Nathan, you need to like start coming up with something else, like regional shows yeah, like, or like a, a podcast or, or like an event once a month in your store physically that people will want to travel to from around the country because who the fuck knows? There's a way to get a $10,000 card if I win X. Like, you're going to need to add other sizzles, what you're about to do is fall in love with the one sizzle that got you there, which then makes you vulnerable long-term. Do you understand? Yes, yes. We, 
we do do all that, Gary. We do trade nights on, you know, once a month. We Good. do like, I'm always listening to what you say, content, content, content. So I'll do, Good. I do kids videos. Good. We do kids Good. collectors club every Good. month. We do what's it worth Wednesday where what everybody. Do you do? What, what are you doing? Their stuff. What, you know, the other thing you can do is maybe take some of the money you're making now, which is different than the kind of money you made before. And maybe you can find the comic book version of you and get into, or the toy version of you and maybe own 50% of a comic book store and teach her or him your model and watch her comic, you know, buy into her comic book store that's only doing 800,000 in revenue this year be the infrastructure for her to do four million on the same concept you came up with. You see where I'm going? Yes. Yes. Diversify. Hey, before you go, I don't think okay. you said what his business was, did he? Where, where, where we can find him? Yeah. yeah. Get a little plug. Um, Grand Slam Collectibles in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. All right. I'm going to check it out. Hey, Grand man, Slam Collectibles. I really appreciate both y'all. Y'all are both an inspiration to the rest of us, man. Y'all keep jet flying, all right? Are you going to be watching... Shark Tank, Matt, what episode, do you, we have a uh, sense of Sunday, this? Sunday, October 21st at Sunday, 9 p.m. Eastern. October 21st, 9 p.m. Sunday, October 21st, 9 p.m. I expect the Vayner Nation to have It's massive- actually going to be, um, it's going to be one of the best episodes they've ever had. It's a very uh, heart-wrenching story, so tune in. It'll, it'll be a special night. Is it when the guest oh. shark was terrible and they had to kick him off the That's set? That's part of it, but they edited okay. that out. <laughs> Got it, okay. All right, Nathan, thank you. Take care. Uh, Matt, October 21st, 9 p.m. I want everybody right now to go into their Google calendars, set alerts. I want viewing parties. I want them to see such a weird spike in Nielsen ratings that they can only give credit to Matt Higgins so that he becomes a, a permanent oh. or whatever the hell he wants. Oh, yeah, exactly. I no and and, and an Instagram too, right? So that I, I, I You're can You're very I can hot now on. You, yeah. It's been fun to watch you get serious <laughs> about your. You know why I like Instagram? Because, um, tell me. Because you have to earn it. It can't be hacked. It doesn't go viral. You have to work. I like that. You have to engage people. You have to talk. It's very organic and natural. I love that. Right? Like you just, you have to put in the effort. Well, all of them are like that really. But I feel like Twitter, things can go viral. I don't know. Instagram, to me at least. Things can go viral. You just haven't put out viral content. Whatever. Whatever. So maybe you're not teaching me. Do I not own a big piece of the biggest (laughs) digital? There are a thousand people here and nobody helps me. Yes, but listen, Michael (laughs) Michael Jordan had two children that wanted to play basketball too. (laughs) <laughs> so sometimes it comes this out is wrong. It's wrong. Just, you, you know, know why I lost the weight? By the way? I didn't lose the weight because of the show. You listen. No, I know no, because you, you would make. You, you told me you said if you don't lose weight by January first, I'm going to mercilessly make fun of you. <laughs> right? You did. Remember that? You said you were so fat. Yeah, it's true. I really, I really knew you had it in you. I did. You I did. How much great. did I lose? How much did I lose? I don't know. Tell us. Fifty pounds. It looks great. Fifty pounds. What happens if you don't eat carbs for a year and you just no, feel really yourself on good. ketosis? Thank you. Um, what do you want to? What do you want to leave everybody here with? We're wrapping up now. What? What? What should the? You know, we have a entrepreneurial kind of crowd watching right now. Like what, what should, what's a great tidbit or something unique or, or you know, because so many of them watch me, like what's something that people don't, we referenced earlier, I'm smart, I see the puck, but I think people know that. Like what's an insight to me or Chang or, or somebody else, like what, what could be a tidbit of like what people aren't thinking about from your perspective? Well, well, well one about you. You are what you, what you see, which I, I love about you. Everything that you put out is the same thing that I get when we have our cup of coffee. So it's a, it's a, it's a credit to you. That um. Empathy is so important. Like everybody I back who's been successful has deep, soulful empathy. So along your way, Nathan was struggling with the fact that he's not maybe firing as fast yeah. and he's grappling with that. That's probably a byproduct of his empathy. You can hear it in his voice. Pres- keep your empathy. You you can get to the top while preserving it. And for me, Matt, what do I do you love- think money and fame expose people or change them? I always say this to, to my wife. I want um, money and, fa- and power and autonomy so I can be more of who I am rather than less. So I, th- I think all it does is reveal. Couldn't like it, I, I want to stay in the place of that 16-year-old kid who felt powerless and I want to use money and power and everything else to inspire and eventually redistribute make a difference and so that's who i was before shark tank that's who i'll be i'll be more of that after matt question you haven't changed you haven't changed from the bagel store like we don't you don't roll around think i'm gary v like you're i mean you can't walk two feet with you people stop you which is very irritating by the way but um (laughs) but you seem to be okay with it i would never want it i think i think (laughs) i'll be honest with you i think if anything i've become i've only I've gone the other way. Like, I'm like just desperately, like to me it would be, I would die if somebody thought that I changed. Don't we talk about, we talk, Gary and I talk about this topic all the time because I don't know if this could be totally cultivated. You were born with the ability to truly love and listen to yourself and block out the hate, which Mm -hmm. I admire that. We have these deep, soulful conversations. I take in much more of the criticism. I always say I play more defense. It's just sort of how I'm wired. But what you have is magical. Like to encourage that in people, to say just trust that inner voice and self-love, like that is the key. I don't know where it came from with you. I guess it's in the I factory I mean, my mom is a beast, a beast. And also look, and, and you know, 
it's, you know, maybe we should, I was listening to your story carefully. Like, it was really great for me to be an immigrant, a terrible student, not good at sports. My entire foundation of my youth was adversity and people telling me I wasn't. Yeah. Thus, like, I didn't grow up in an environment looking for anybody's reinforcement. Like, all I needed was myself. You know, my, I needed my mom to a degree and then I was old enough that that became me. And so at some level, I'm, I just, here's my big thing. And you, you're this thing for me, like thinking about our conversations. I'm just not interested in the people that boo in the second quarter. <laughs> like, for me, this is my ju- thing on judgment or the hate along the way. If those people are right, when it goes to triple zero of the game, then I have to concede that truth. If they were right that I was full of shit, not as smart as I think, like whatever it may be, and it ends, I've had my career, and I was not successful. I over leveraged, I went to zero, I had to work for somebody one day. I would just, not, like, you, sh- you know, I don't like <laughs> shaking people's hands after you lose a game of basketball, but I do it because I lost, and that's the facts. Yeah, but that me, capacity to do that is superhuman. But I, I mean, want. I don't know but where I, it comes but I, from. But I don't think it has to be, and that's why I'm yeah. trying to bring more. Like it, it's actually practical. Yeah. It's the same reason that I don't get excited. The Jets were beating the Browns fourteen nothing at halftime the other day. We lost. Like just because I'm winning. Like I'll, back to what he, Nathan was worried about. Just because I'm conceivably winning right this minute, everything could start going downhill tomorrow. And if it does, then I lost. And it goes in a lot of ways. It not only goes professionally, and this is where I don't think people are being thoughtful. I don't just score on the money part. A lot of people that boo us along the way are just talking about money, right? Mm, Matt Lauer's brand looks different today than it did a year and a half ago. Mm. He was making 20 plus million, 30 million on his show, right? So to me, back to the empathy thing, I'm going to, I'm, I know it, you, you know this way better than most. Very few people know it as well as you do. I will always leaving economics on the table because I don't believe being the greatest entrepreneur of this generation is just the person that made the most money. Like the reason I think I can beat Zucks and Elon and Sarah Blakely and others is because for me, and I get to judge because that's my life, (laughs) the greatest entrepreneur of this generation is not only somebody, and I do think you have to succeed, I do think I have to make lots of money because that's the game of an entrepreneur, but the one who brings the most value to the entrepreneurial space, yeah, that's interesting to me. I mean, you put something out the other day, you posted, I forgot how you worded it, but you said, focus on what you do well because uh, other people will focus enough on what you're not doing well. That's right. Well, it's interesting, but a lot of people take the opposite approach. I gotta mitigate my downside. I gotta work on what I'm not good because at. They, because you're they, all in on what you're I'll good I'll tell you at. why. Because they don't realize whoever they're scared is in control of them is not as in control as they think. Mm. The board of directors, the, the CEO, uh, the 51% equity partner, Yes, in the micro of that moment, definitely not in the macro of life. All right. Question of the day. Every guest gets to ask the question of the day. So what question do you, Matt, have for the Vayner Nation? It's an amazing opportunity for you to get some insights. Okay, explain it. Go say a little more. Well, I'm thrilled to now know that you don't watch the show at all. Okay. But when I, have, <laughs> when I have a guest, when I have a guest, he or she gets to ask a question and then thousands of comments come on Facebook and YouTube and some guests that silly things like what's your favorite color? Others are very strategic because they're trying to actually literally get an insight at that moment of like a trend or a thing. Or then some people are just trying to scratch their itch to more opinions on something that they're debating within themselves right now. Okay. So what's your question? All right, what's, what's a product that I don't know about that you think I should know about that is gonna be massive that's not on the radar right now? I like so that. I can buy it and be and help make Gary rich. Or, <laughs> or. Thank you, brother. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks. You keep asking questions, we'll keep answering them.